All right, so thanks for being here and making this special time. And the change was due to a scheduling conflict I had with this quarter. Whenever, whenever I'm organizing a seminar, it's conflict with the regular time, but this will be the last organization I'll do this quarter. Yeah, but thank you for making it. And so we will try to go through the most important things I want to cover. So since we have very small, a um, small number of in-person people here. I hope you can use the chance to ask some questions and we can be more interactive. All right, so just to give you a very quick recap, in the last lecture, we talked about factors as covariates. By factors, we mean that we have categorical predictors. So the levels or the values of a predictor are not numerical. And you have to make them as categorical, either ordinal or, or, or nominal, right? Ordinal means that the levels still have, oh, I have another, sorry. I'm not sharing the screen right like that. And displays arrangement there. What? So you should be able to see now, yeah. So categorical has ordinal and nominal. Ordinal means that the levels have an order, like high school, college, graduate school. The for nominal, the levels are not ordered. For example, the colors as yellow, blue, red. So what you are interested in is that whether there is some differences on your expectation of why, on your expectation of the outcome or response when your factor, when your predictor's level changes from one to the other. So therefore, in our analysis, in the modeling, we will need to set a reference level. Then we assess the effect of other levels relative to the reference level. So here we are talking about two factors, right? factors one and two. So in this two factor model, we consider the effect of factor one's level I as alpha I factor two's level J as gamma J. And this is the interaction effect when factor one is level I, factor two is level J, the interaction called eta IJ. For the identifiability issue, which means that when we have the same likelihood, then the parameters should have unique values. We don't want to have two sets of parameters with different values, but give us the same likelihood. Otherwise the maximum likelihood estimation would not work, right? So for this identifiability issue, we need to set alpha one and gamma one to be zero. And also all the interaction terms in which the first factor is at level one or the second factor is at level one, they should all be set to zero. And then we can use the multiple linear regression matrix form to do the estimation because we just need to create a design matrix to reflect the factors. So for example, if factor one has, has I levels, then we need to create I minus one dummy binary variables called one hot coding, on hot encoding to represent this factor one. If factor two has a total of J levels, we need to introduce J minus one dummy variables to encode factor two. And for this interaction term, we need to introduce I minus one times J minus one, that many columns in our design matrix. So you can see it's a very big matrix to estimate if you want to include all interactions of levels. The message is that a factor with more than two levels is actually more complicated than a numerical variable, right? Because you need to encode a three level factor by two variables instead of one variable. Okay, following on that, I want to talk about this analysis of covariance. So we know ANOVA stands for analysis of variance. Analysis of covariance short as ANCOVA. So, it, it, so it's just interesting because it has both categorical predictors and numerical predictors in one model. That's the interesting part of it. And for this, we want to use the notation, okay, for small x as the numerical predictor, and we have one other predictor, which is a factor with I level. So for simplicity, we just assume that there's one numerical predictor, one factor predictor. 
And for the factor predictor, we can categorize our N observations into I levels. So we assume that there are N I observations in level I. So the sum of N I's from one to big I is equal to N. Okay, and then we didn't know Y I J as the Jth observation in level I. So then we can basically list our observations within each level I. And then once we go through all big I levels, we have all the observations. So for Yij, the numerical predictor is Xij. Okay, as we have used for this two level structure before, which is a good way to summarize the model, we have a systematic structure about the mean of our response yij. The expectation of yij, we call that mu ij, is defined as the intercept mu has nothing to do with the predictors and the contribution of level i from ml small i from the factor and the numerical predictors effect as the slope gamma. So it's mu plus alpha i plus gamma times x i j. That's the mean structure. So what does it actually mean? You see, because we have the common gamma as the slope. So then it means that regardless of the level of factor i, we have the same slope. And the factor i's effect is changing the intercept, right? What is the level before you look at the numerical predictor? So then you can see if my level, if my factor has three levels, essentially I have three mean lines lines in terms of x, i, j. So I have x, i, j as the x axis, mu, i, j as the y axis. The three lines share the same slope gamma, but each line has its own intercept. For level one, in which alpha one is set to zero, the intercept is just mu. For level two, intercept is mu plus alpha two. Inter for slope, slope three, intercept is mu plus alpha three. So that's the mean. Mean is about the systematic structure. The random structure is about the very random variable, randomness. So for random structure, we have yij distributed as a normal distribution with mean as mu ij variance sigma squared. So common variance is not specific to observation ij. Right. So the same thing we have done for linear model. Simple assumption. But strong assumption, which we assume that the random error contribution has nothing to do with the mean or with the observation. And this is called a homoscedasticity. Uh, once this is violated, we have some approaches to change the model or change the model fitting, which we will touch next. We will touch later. Identifiability make alpha one equals zero. So then the parameters we are interested in, mu intercept, alpha two to alpha i, the effects of i minus one levels, slope gamma. So then if we write our design matrix in this way, first column are the ones for intercept, then the columns two to i are for the dummy variables encoding, right? So we just put zero if the, if the observation is not in that level. Right, so we put zero, but if it's in that level, we put one. Finally, one column for the numerical variable. And then we can use the same matrix form as before. So then beta hat still has that standard format, right? So beta hat LS or beta hat MLE. In both ways you do estimation, it's still X transpose X inverse X transpose Y. So we always have that. Okay, and if we want to include interactions, what it means is that we allow different levels of the factor to have a different slope in the numerical vector. So in this case, you see that the three lines may have different slopes. That's the key difference they may have different slopes. So then you see the slope should bear the level information. So we write this gamma plus eta i. 
eta i is the effect of level i, the effect of level i on the slope, right? Then to ensure identifiability, eta one should also be set just as alpha one to be zero. Then in the design matrix, we would need those additional columns to correspond to etas, right? I minus one columns. And then you see in these columns, the key thing is that the value you fill in into the design matrix is no longer zero or one. They're not like the levels, they're not the values you have here for alpha two to alpha I, because it's just indicating the existence, the level, because here the alpha parameters are effect on the intercept. So as the effect on the intercept should be zero one. But here, they are the effects on the slope of xij. So therefore, if this observation belongs to the level two, so because it's x2, if it's y21, it means that observation is the first one in the second level of the factor, then you should put a numerical value x21 here to x2n1. So you have n2 rows for this xij. And the first n one rows as the observations are not in level one. No, but they are as they are in level one, not in levels two to i. They are all zeros. Finally, last level, last level i, big i. We have n i observations here. So for those, you will put x i one to x i n i in the last column. Okay, so that's what we need to pay attention to in the design matrix, because with the design matrix, again, it becomes a matrix for linear regression. Okay, so if I want to test whether the inter interaction terms, whether the factor has any effect on the numerical predictor, if that's our question, then we just need to test whether eta two to eta i are all zero. And for this question, it's the same problem we have talked before, right? You could do the wall test or likelihood ratio test or hierarchical ANOVA to help you do the test. That's all. So we have talked about linear model with numerical predictors only, factors only, or a combination of both. All right. Do we have any questions? about what we have covered so far, because next we'll talk about the diagnostics of linear model. Okay. All right. So if you have no more questions, if you don't have any questions, we'll move on to model diagnostics. This is very general, not specific just to the linear model, but it's actually about statistical modeling how would you make sure the model is reasonable? So of course, the first step is all is model questions from Gaussian error terms. How do we formulate systematic structure? That is, how do we link the, how do we link the expectation of yi to predictors, right? The mu i is the expectation of yi for observation y. How do we link that to the predictors of observation i? Then given the model, second case, second step is to fit the model to data to estimate model parameters. And mostly we use the MLE, maximum likelihood estimation. And this becomes an optimization problem. How do we optimize the likelihood? Well, how do we maximize the likelihood? And in some cases, if you don't use the likelihood, all those statisticians like to use likelihood because we have the randomness part. In some cases, the maximum likelihood estimation can be just taken as the minimization of a loss function. So you have maximization of likelihood, but you can also look at it as, as a minimization of a loss function. And in many machine learning approaches, they directly work on the loss function to minimize it. But still, the goal is to find model parameters by optimization. Finally, we have the model parameter estimates. We check the model. We check how the model fits the data, whether the model assumptions have any variations. And that's 
what we will talk about, the diagnostics. Okay, so that's the three-step thing. Model formulation, model fitting, model diagnostics. Okay, in terms of the regression model diagnostics, we rely on checking the residuals. So two things. One is to check the residuals about our assumptions of the error terms, right? The error terms are assumed to be normally distributed, same variance, homoplasticity. That's our assumption. And we also want to make sure whether some observations, some data points have larger than other data points influence on our results. So whether we have some kind of outlier issue there that may make our results sensitive to our, our to those outliers. So we look at two things. One is about the checking the error term assumption, checking whether our assumption about the randomness is reasonable. Second, checking the existence of outliers. Let me just put it here. Assumption. Check. Second is outlier. Check. It's these two aspects. So to check the random error term, we will take the residual, we call this E, as the difference between the observed response Y and the predicted response Y hat, right? And we have all these formula because the beta hat formula, then we call this Y hat equals to hat matrix times Y. The hat matrix is from this Y hat. Then, we would have the residual as y minus hy, then it's identity minus h times y. So we can easily verify that if the model is correct, if we do have the error terms, error terms have mean zero, then the expectation of the residual should be zero. And the variance of the residual, I think actually this was a, from a previous lecture, so this is a recap, would be sigma square, which is the error term sigma square times this I minus H matrix. So care, be careful about dimension. I minus H is N times N. So for each residual, EI, the variance is the i diagonal entry in this matrix. So it's basically sigma square times one minus H I I. Okay, all right. And then you can see that if we are interested in the what's the scale of HI, whether it could, because you have this worry, right? What if HI is bigger than one? Then I have a negative variance for my residual. But be assured that this is not the case. We will not happen this because we can prove that HII is between zero and one. And the proof is based on the trace of the hat matrix, the H matrix. So we know that we could have the hat, we know that we could use this uh, idempotency, idempotency of the hat matrix. That is H squared equals H, okay? And because of this, we can use the, we can have this very interesting result that is, HII based on this HII is from the right hand side and it can be equal to this summation of HI j squared j from one to n based on the left hand side h times h squared. You have a, you have the equation here, identity here. And then you can write it out as HI one squared plus HII squared plus HIN squared, then of course, this is bigger than HII squared. So then you will get HII greater or equal than HII squared. That will give you HII being between zero and one. So therefore, you don't need to worry about having a negative term here. But one thing you need to be sure is that you need to be clear, clear about is that residuals are not error terms. In this homoscedastic assumption, the error terms share the same variance sigma square, but the residuals clearly do not share the same variance because each EI residuals variance is sigma square times one minus HII. So for different eyes, the residual EI's variance, variances will be different. 
right? So different residuals have different variances. This is very different from the error term. So we, we can actually have an explicit form of the variance HII when we are in the situation of simple linear model. So in the simple linear model, there's only one intercept, one numerical predictor. So we call this P equals two, right? Because P is the dimension, column dimension of the design matrix, includes the intercept. So the explicit form here, you can see it's one over N plus this ratio. In the, the denominator is the common denominator. It's basically the sum of squared differences between the n x i and the x bar, the average. So I have the same denominator for all the i's, but the numerator is just x i minus x bar squared. So then you can see for some observation i, if its x i is far away from the center, h i i will be bigger, right? The h i will be bigger, so it means that when h i is bigger, variance e i is smaller. And what does it mean? It means that when h i i is bigger, so basically that implies that okay, my dots are like here, my point. Observation like here, the, the ones whose x i value is far away from the x bar from the mean. Then for these data points, for these observations, they would have a large influence on the linear line fitting, making their residuals small, right? So EI is their own residual small. So this is very important to know. So these points, i's with large h i i, would have bigger influence on the linear model fitting than the data points with small HII. And this can also show you why linear model is something very important when your sample size N is not so big. Because in the big data setting, now people talk about that, when N is super big, then probably you don't really care about the influence of one observation. But when your data sample size is not so big, then every observation is critical, right? Then you need to care about its influence. And HAI is about the influence. Okay. And actually, we have a term for this, which we will introduce later, called leverage. Leverage is about the potential influence of a data point observation I on the overall trend fitting. So leverage can be considered as the, in the physics, right? You have the leverage. It's like, if the leverage is big, you can have more influence to on the, on the force, basically. And it's the same thing here. So for these points far away from X bar, they have larger leverages than the ones in the middle. The, the middle ones do not influence the line fitting that much, as which I think intuitively makes sense. All right. Do we have any questions about this? If not, then we will move on to what's, what do we do with the fact that different residuals have different variances, right? This is something not good for us because we want to check this constant variance assumption, whether the error terms have the same variance then how can we use the residuals EIs to help us check this assumption of epsilon lines? Okay, to answer this question, we, the first idea is to use the standardized residual. Standardized residual denoted as SI is by standardizing each EI so that after standardization, all these standardized residuals have the same variance. So to standardize EI, you need to use a standard deviation of EI. And you have already have the variance of EI as sigma squared times one minus HII. So the square root of that is the standard deviation of EI. And we put it here. But sigma is always unknown. But HII is known, right? HII is just the i-th diagonal entry of the hat matrix. And you can see hat matrix is just x times x transpose x inverse 
times x transpose. That's the hat matrix. And for this hat matrix, you would know its values because it's based on a design matrix. So HII is known, but sigma is unknown. You need to estimate it. To estimate it, again, we use the estimator based on the residual. So it's the residual sum squares divided by M minus P. And we know that if the model is correct, then this sigma square hat is unbiased and it's consistent for the parameter sigma square. So it converges to sigma square in probability when n goes to infinity. So this justifies the use of sigma hat to plug in for sigma. That's the standardized residual. And such standardized residual would approximately follow a standard normal distribution. And then, because of the standard normal distribution, you should be familiar with the critical value 1.96, right? We know that if it's a standard normal random variable, then its chance of being in the interval from negative 1.96 to positive 1.96 is 95%. Because of that, we approximate 1.96 as two and use that as the rule of the thumb which means that you would call an observation I to have a large standardized residual or likely an outlier in terms of the residual if it's standardized residual, absolute value is greater than increment two. Okay, so it's for the second diagnosis I just mentioned, outlier check. But there's something you might be concerned about. That is, if I have an outlier in my data, then the outliers will affect my residual sum of squares. It will, it will affect my estimate for the sigma square. So it will be, it will influence the sigma square hat a lot. And how would this be, and this sigma square hat will enter the standard error in the denominator. So you see that the outlier still has effect on the standardization residual. So logically, you might think, okay, if some data points are outlier, maybe I should exclude them from fitting my model so they are less influential on sigma square hat. That's the logic. Because of that, people have come up with this idea called jackknife residual. So jackknife is a jargon I want you to be, I want you to know, actually. What does it mean? Jackknife, in short, means that you exclude one observation at a time to assess your model, okay? So if you have n observations as your sample size, then for jackknife, you will actually do the model fitting for n runs. Each time you exclude one observation, only use the remaining n minus one observations to fit the model, okay? So in this case, if you want to check whether observation I is an outlier, you exclude it from your model fitting. You only use the, re the remaining n minus one observations to actually fit the model, estimate sigma square. Yeah, using the n minus one observations. Then put that sigma, sigma hat into the, into the denominator. So basically, the jackknife residual, the only difference comparing these two, S, I, and T, I, the only difference is what is your estimate for sigma. So in the standardized residual, your, st your sigma hat is just from fitting the full, using the full data set from the, using all n observations here. But in the jackknife residual, you call it sigma hat I, it's by excluding observation I from the model fitting. Okay, then you can see your sample size is reduced to n minus one. The RSSI is the residual sum of, sum of square by excluding observation i divided by new sample size n minus one minus the model complexity parameter p. You call this sigma hat i squared. Okay, but you might wonder about the computational intensity, right, especially in the old days, when people do linear model fitting, it's by hand. If you don't even have a computer at that time, how can you afford n linear regressions? 
But luckily, there's a theoretical result. In this theoretical result, you only need to fit the model once, which is very nice. And in this result, there is a relationship between Ti and Si. Si is the standardized residual here. Ti is the jackknife residual here. But you can basically convert your Si to Ti using this formula without running n runs of regression. That's the nice thing about using jackknife. You know, jackknife is actually similar to bootstrap, if you are familiar with that. They're both resampling based method, except that in bootstrap, you keep the original sample size n, but you do sampling with replacement, right? So you could sample in a real, in one observation, again, more than once in your bootstrap sample. So sample size is kept, but you may have repetitions in bootstrap. But jackknife is not sampling with replacements, without replacement. Every time you have a sample size of n minus one, you will throw one sample. So theoretically, they have some differences, right? Because this one doesn't keep the original sample size, but you actually still have the same, how to say, asymptotics if you let n go to infinity, because n minus one will also go to infinity. Um, but I would say on the finite sample of size n and being finite, then there are some differences. But the good thing about jackknife in the pre-computer age is that you can have some closed form formula. So you don't need to do the n jackknife runs, actually. You save the computation, even though conceptually you are doing this leave one out at a time. But Bootstrap has some advantages theoretically. And now with a computer, being available is no longer an issue. So bootstrap, we have to do the bootstrap, right? It's not like we're doing it conceptually. But still, good to know that there's a jackknife thing in those days. And also, compared to just standardized residual, jackknife residual has excluded observation I if it's being examined. If it's the thing you're checking, whether it's an outlier or not, you exclude it from the calculation of your estimate of C. Okay. So you see that we have these two things, standardized residual, jackknife residual, for the similar purpose of outlier detection. And there's one more thing, which is called predictive residual, as you introduce. So in predictive residual, you are basically comparing yi. So basically you see here, the ei, EI is from the residual and it's from the model fitted using N observations. You didn't exclude observation I when you get the residual. But since you want to exclude observation I from estimating the sigma, why don't you exclude it from model fitting? That's where the predicted residual comes in, comes from. You do YI observed response minus Y hat I the fitted predicted response without including i in the model fitting. So basically, when we get this yi hat, we excluded observation i in model fitting, then use only the n minus one values for the response for model fitting to get a yi hat. Then we take the difference. The good thing here is that if you know that the fitted value depends on the beta estimate, beta hat, and beta hat will depend on the y's, right? It's x transpose x inverse x transpose y. So y1, so the n minus one observations will be in this beta hat i, but yi itself will not be involved in this beta hat i. This creates some nice independence between the two terms. The second term only depends on the other n minus y observations, first term only yi. This independence is nice to work with because then you can say, if I'm interested in this predictive residual, the variance of that can be decomposed just as the sum of the two variances because the two variables and the variables are independent. That's the nice thing. And we know that for the first term variance yi, its variance is just sigma squared. For the variance of yi hat, here, we are introducing the design matrix by excluding the i's observation called x parenthesis i. 
So this one is n minus one by p dimensions. So we take that design matrix to do the model fitting. So for this x transpose x inverse x transpose y part, they all have the i-th observation excluded. So that's how we get that's how we get this beta hat i from this. And this is the i-th observations predictor vector. So we do x i transpose this beta hat i excluded, then we get the y hat i this way. So the variance of that, you know here, the only random is comes from this y vector with the i observation excluded. This is n minus one dimensional. So it's variance covariance matrix is sigma square times this one. So the variance of y i, this is equal to sigma square times an identity matrix with n minus one dimension because we have only n minus one observations here. So therefore, when you expand this term, it's basically a matrix left multiplied to this n minus one vector. Then we can easily see that the variance of this is just sigma square times this term. It can be verified by linear algebra. And you see that what it tells us is that the variance of the predictor residual is two terms. One is sigma square. One is sigma square times this. And for your information, this term is a scalar because x i transpose is one row, one by p, right? p by p, p by one. So we get a scalar. So essentially, if you want to be more accurate, <laughs> so you could define. So basically, you can define the jackknife schedule to be in this way. So you, when you define the residual, you use the predictive residual instead of the original residual. And for the standard error part, you are using this term by plugging sigma i hat by excluding the i -th observation. So you could exclude i -th observation from both estimating sigma and also from the residual calculation. Okay, so again, if we believe this thing follows or approximately follows standard normal distribution, the rule of thumb is to check absolute value of the jackknife residual where this bigger than two. Okay. And another alternative approach, I think these are very interesting thoughts, is to think about a test, whether we can do some hypothesis testing about whether the i-th observation is an outlier. So for this, we want to introduce an indicator to indicate whether in the ground truth, in our, if we have every information, in the ground truth, whether the i-th observation is an outlier. Okay, so basically it's one, if the i-th observation is an outlier, zero otherwise. So to actually do that, we actually introduce an additional term if the i-th observation is an outlier. So the outlying degree is denoted by gamma. What we mean is that if the i-th observation is not an outlier, then its mean of yi is just xi transpose beta. Otherwise, if it, if it is an outlier, its mean has this additional term gamma, additional value gamma. So gamma is just the degree of outlierness. And then our hypothesis testing becomes to test whether gamma is zero. Because if it's zero, it means that it's not an outlier, okay? If it is zero, if it's zero, it's not an outlier. But if we reject it, it means that this, this gamma cannot be ignored, then it's an outlier. So, so that's the rationale. And basically to test this, because you are interested in this data point I star, right? This observation I star. What you do is that you add this additional column for the binary indicators in your design matrix. 
So in this design matrix, the newly added column is about the outlier indicator. So the I star row has uh, has one because in this case, Z I star is one. Other Z I's are set to zero. So your parameter would have your previous beta and you have this previous beta and this additional gamma as your new parameters, right? So you have say, this is P dimensional and this is one dimensional. So you have a one more dimension for this gamma, for this additional column. Then it becomes to test the gamma being zero or not. And then you do T test. Just like when we said, if you are interested in testing whether one dimension of our, our coefficient parameter is there or not, we do T test. And basically we do that. And it's very interesting that people have shown this testing approach is equivalent to using the jackknife residual. So for example, if you relax the snow distribution, the T distribution to be standard normal distribution, then basically you have this equivalence between this testing approach and using the jackknife residual approach. So this becomes your test statistic and you threshold that for decision. Okay, if the test statistics absolute value is so big, bigger than two, I call it outlier. And here you are testing this gamma being zero or not, but still you can show equivalence to the jackknife residual approach, which is, which is very interesting. Oh, do you have any questions about this? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So the TI is just the jack, the predicted residual divided by its standard error with the sigma being plugged in from the estimate that excludes the i's observation. Okay. Yeah, so everything we have talked about are outlier detection. Whether we have some outliers that are that are obvious or that seem to be problematic for the linear model. But we haven't talked about the model diagnostics, right? Like the model check, whether the homospecificity is reasonable, whether the linear model is reasonable. We haven't touched that part yet. Okay, so to summarize, standardized residual is the starting point because we observe that the residuals do not have the same variables. So we want to standardize it. But then we realize that in the standardization, we need a plugin for a sigma, and it doesn't make sense to plug in by including the i observation because it could be an outlier. Then we have the jackknife. Then we want to exclude the i observation from both sigma and then from the residual definition. Okay, and then we show the equivalence to a hypothesis test whether the i observation is an outlier. So essentially, we use the fit and model to help us decide, right? To whether the IS observation seems to be an outlier, whether we have a justification to. To not include it. Conditions can have bigger influence on the model fitting. And this is the leverage, which I just mentioned, right, before I talked about residuals. Leverage, potential influence, it's about whether an observer, observation about on the line fitting is big, and it's only using the design matrix. It doesn't do the regression because the leverage is just the HII, depending on the hat matrix. And the hat matrix, as a recall, it's just X times X transpose X inverse X transpose. Okay, so it's an M by M matrix. In this high matrix, you only use the design matrix, not Y at all. So you didn't do model fitting. You're just checking, okay, given my design, some observations I know will have a bigger influence on my model fitting. And these are very important. 
So I don't know if you have heard about a subfield in statistics called experimental design. So in experimental design, people work with this design matrix because they want to collect observations for better model building. And when they collect observations, they need to know, okay, how do I choose this observation to be important or not by looking at the design matrix? Okay, so having a large leverage doesn't mean observation is bad, doesn't mean that we should exclude it. But these are the things we should pay attention to because they are the like the determinants of our linear model. Okay, then how do we set, how do we know whether a leverage, an HII is too big? Is big to be to be concerned about or big to be to 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 pay pay attention to to answer this question we need to look at this trace which is for all the hii if i take the sum it's actually actually i can return the pen to you yeah thank you so we could actually Look at the sum of HII, which is equal to the trace of H, and we know this is equal to P. We have derived this before. And then with this, then as there are N HII, so it's P over N. I have done the pen. Thank you. <laughs> we have, as this is P over N is the average leverage, and we multiply the average by, again, factor of two, the magic number two and call that rule of thumb. So it's two times P over N, two times the average. If it's bigger than that, we call it large leverage. Okay. Difference between residuals and leverage is that for leverage, we don't need to do model fitting. Finally, Cook's distance. Cook's distance it does depend on model fitting. So it's the actual influence. But this one, yeah. Mm -hmm. Had matrix. Very good question. The off diagonal entry would affect this. So if you recall, we would have this one, right? So basically, what is the covariance matrix? Covariance matrix of this beta hat, this is P by P. Oh, we will put the right variance, yeah, just to be consistent. Variance covariance matrix is sigma square x transpose x inverse, right? So in this case, we actually, the off diagonal entry is, the, is important for this variance covariance matrix, and we will actually matter. It will actually matter when you do the wall test, likelihood ratio test, this will all matter. But when we talk about this hat matrix n by n, it's not about parameters, it's about the observations. That's a very good question. So um, it's just that when we look at the residual, we are, this is because of this residual, just, we just wrote this as sigma square one minus HII. So it will make the residual to be very variable, right? If the variance is big. But it's not about beta hat yet. So we're just looking at each observation as residual being big or small. But for the leverage discussion. But when we talk about the influence on beta hat, this is what we'll talk about. It's the Kutz distance, actual influence. So if you are caring about beta hat because you are um, doing this inference problem, right? The coefficients are your interest then you are interested in knowing whether observation I really have an influence on my beta hat. So therefore, in the quick distance, you will have two versions of beta hat, one that uses all the N observations, one that excludes the I's observation. So for the excluded version, we call beta hat I. For the all-inclusive version, we call beta hat. And the Cook's distance is defined based on you know, the squared difference because it's matrix form. So it's like beta hat I minus beta hat P dimensional transpose times itself, right? But we want to weight things. So the weight is based on the inverse of the variance, covariance matrix of beta. So that's why to your question here, the off diagonal entries here 
they would get into play in the inverse. Yeah, so yeah, it's right here. So, and then you divide this by number of parameters P. So you see, this is very similar to the wall test, right? The wall test statistic. We are basically re-weighting the entries in my beta hat I minus beta hat, the differences between the two beta hats, the two beta hat vectors, P dimensional differences, but we weight each difference by the inverse of the variance covariance matrix of beta hat. Yeah, similar to the wall test, but basically we are testing this beta equals beta i kind of doing this test because if this is small, it means that the two beta halves are close to each other, right? So when they're close to each other, then observation i doesn't have a big influence. Then we don't worry about it. But if it's big, then observation i does have a big influence and we are concerned. That's it. All right, but you know what we are doing here, the rule of thumb here is actually based on the chi-square distribution, actually. For the chi-square distribution, the expectation is equal to the degree of freedom. So chi-square P has the mean as the expectation. It's a, that's the mean of P. So the rule of thumb here is based on that, okay, once you divide by P, then the expectation is divided by P. So it becomes one. That, that's how the rough rule of thumb is from there. So it's the chi-square expectation divided by the degree of freedom and it's equal to one. And I want to say that even though I wrote this intuition as if we're doing this test, beta equals beta hat i, but this is not accurate. We cannot write it this way. When you write it in this way, it's a wrong statistical statement because in the null hypothesis, we should not have random variables. It should be testing the parameter equal to some constant value. But this is actually random, right? It's basically based on your data. So that's what I'm saying. Even though the motivation is kind of like what well test for this, but we cannot say it exactly. It's not a right statement. That's just a thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And could you say it again? Is the okay? Yes, cut distance is the actual influence. Leverage is the potential influence. It's just that okay, this x being so far away from the center, so it will have a big influence on the line. But having a big influence doesn't mean it's bad. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because when Cook's distance is small, it means that okay, yes, the top point, the data point, the observation can have does have a large leverage, but excluding it, the line stays the same, right? So then we are not so worried about it. But if we exclude it, the line is very different, then we are concerned. So let me give you one, yeah, that's a very good question. I should give you a more concrete example to explain the two things. So I will give you one example, large leverage, small actual distance or small cooks Let's say Cook's distance. So for example, like this, I would say, just use one predictor, x, y. And if my points are like this, and they have a very far away points like this. So you can see clearly this point, it has a large leverage, but it doesn't have a small influence online. But we can have large leverage large Cook's distance. So for data point like this, we would be, I think you might have your own version, but my version would be points like this. And I have a point like that. Yeah, so in this case, including it, the line will be very different compared to not including, yeah. And this is the case we should be concerned, right? But this is not the case we should be concerned, yeah. And also you see that for this case, if this point wouldn't be picked if we check the residual, because the, if the line goes this way, the residual is not small, it's not big, right? But in this case, you see that if the Cook's distance is large, the residual check may not work because if the line is totally drawn by this point to be this way, the residual is still small, right? 
but the jackknife may pick it because jackknife by excluding it, the line becomes this way. Yeah. So, so that's why I think it's very important to see why the jackknife version is more reasonable because the jackknife version, the line will go this way, then the predicted residual will be this one. And that's good. Yeah, the jackknife distance, you see, I would call if this is I, right? This is why I hat is right here. And this is why I. So then you take the difference is y i minus y i minus it, which is the side my i hat, right? Yes, babe. Okay, any more questions? Yeah, these are very great questions. And, and, and also, I think many people like linear model for a reason, because there are many things we can say clearly, right? <laughs> Instead of just not knowing it. Okay, so one more thing. So one more thing I want to say here is this, the prediction interval. The prediction interval is very important for our decision on one observation. So if our if our focus here is not the inference of beta, it's not about the effects, but one particular observation. This is typically the task that machine learning is very good at, right? The prediction accuracy. Then the question is, if we want to use this yi as our as our as our predicted outcome, how much do we trust it? How variable it is. So that's why prediction interval is about the variance of y hat. And then we can do the calculation because y i hat is known to be x i transpose times beta hat. Beta hat is the coefficient estimate, x i is the predictor vector. And again, we can open up this variance formula as x i transpose variance covariance matrix beta hat times x i. So again, this is one by p, p by p, p by one. Okay, and then you can see that it has this formula, which we have already seen for the pre predictive residual. So that sigma square times this scalar thing. Okay, so what we want to say here is that using the linear model, this is what you will predict as the uncertainty of your y i hat once you fit the model and you have to plug in again, sigma square for the using the estimated value to plug in. So you can have a value. The prediction interval is, in, is useful if the model is reasonable, right? If the linear model is reasonable, this prediction interval can give you some uncertainty or confidence about the i-th prediction. If it's too big, then maybe you don't trust it so much. If it's small, then you don't care that much. You think, okay, I, I can trust it. So I think how do we incorporate prediction interval into prediction problems is something statistics can help with this, with machine learning because we can provide uncertainty quantification. So when we use the model, you will use the model's prediction to make decisions. We are more cautious. We are not overly trusting our YIs, Y hats. Okay, I hope this makes sense. All right, so these are all about diagnostics for outliers. How about the diagnostics for the model? Whether the model is a reasonable model. So the visual check, the one we use most in our analysis, actually, you know, we can actually get all these plots in R by fitting linear model. If you just search for R linear model diagnostics, R has a way to produce all these nice plots if you use the function LM. So you can use this to check the model. And the residual plots basically checks the residuals in relation to yi hats. So every dot is one observation. The x-axis is the predicted yi hat. Y-axis is the residual ei. So you want to have the residuals kind of 
evenly scattered along the line of y equals zero, this horizontal line, and the scatter doesn't, the, the spread of the scatter does not change much along your y hat values. So you don't want the residual to depend on y i. This is considered to be good. Right? So basically, you satisfy the expectation of EI being zero. That's what you need if the linear model is correct. But you would also need to be aware of this very off pattern. So if you do see this doesn't hold, and if the pattern is like this, if the pattern is like there is a clear trend or association, positive correlation between the residuals and y I hat, then this will indicate that a linear model is wrong. It's not reasonable because your residuals still have a pattern, right? It's not random. So in this case, you need to make sure you need to modify your model. So you need to modify your model, the mean function, the systematic structure of your model so that you can achieve a residual point like the left, like the left one. And of course, you can always replace EI by the TI, right? Because that one is the one that excludes the i observation. So the, it's a better residual for checking. That's for this checking this mean zero thing. The residuals have mean zero. And this is about the systematic structure. Let me just add this. The systematic structure is reasonable about the mean. Okay. And this one is about the QQ plot to check the normality of the residuals. So because we said that, okay, the standard residuals or the jackknife residuals, they should be approximately normal, standard normal, then you could check this whether this holds using the QQ plot standing for quantile quantile plot. So quantile quantile plot is basically plotting theoretical quantiles against empirical quantiles. So how do we define it? I think this is related to the definition of a quantile. Maybe I should spend some time talking about it. So the definition of quantile is you can define the empirical quantile in a way. You can define the theoretical quantile in a way. So let me just make it simple. So if you have just n equals two uh, residual, okay, let me put it this way. Okay, one residual is minus one. The other residual is one. So I'm just making it very simple. You have two residuals. Then the empirical quantile, And this can be found by the, I think in R it's, you can have multiple ways to do it, but you can Google the thing. So for definition of empirical quantile, you need a method. How do we define it? But one naive way is to say, okay, this is the minimum, this is the maximum. Then I would try to, I would say this is the zero percent quantile. This is the most naive way, okay. And this is the 100% quantile. Okay. So they are the quantile values. One correspond to 0%, one correspond to 100%, minimum, maximum. Then if you want to find the corresponding theoretical quantiles under um, standard normal, if that's what you want to find, then there's a problem. What is the zero person quantile for standard normal? zero, negative infinity. What is the 100% quantile, positive infinity? Then this QQ plot is impossible because basically what you will have is that empirical quantile, one axis, theoretical quantile on the other axis. So here you would have negative one, positive one, but the negative one's corresponding value in the X axis is negative infinity, right? And this one's corresponding is the positive. You wouldn't be able to do it. So, so, so basically it's not possible. So therefore, when we define empirical quantile, we need some modification. Yeah. So for example, you could define this to be, I'm just making it up. You could define this to be 25 
person quantile, you could define this to be 75 person quantile. If you modify that, then this value, these two values would be correspondingly from normal distribution. Okay, so then this is standard normal. We just find whatever value, 25% probability here, take this value. And this value, let's call it A. And if you have right-hand side, 25%, so on the left-hand side, you have 75%. You cut this value Y. Then the theoretical quantile will be correspondingly A and B. So then you will plot um, you will plot two points, one as negative 1A, one as positive 1B, as in your paper plot, right? If you have n data points, you calculate empirical quantile, find the corresponding theoretical quantile. If they agree well, if the if the data distribution can be well described by standard normal, then the quantile quantile plot should be a straight diagonal line. But if you have some clear violations, which will indicate the normality assumption is wrong. Actually, I have another more, I mean, realistic version of it. So basically, you take the residuals, sort them, standardized residuals, your SIs, sort them from smallest to the biggest. And this is the order statistic notation. Parenthesis one means the smallest, parenthesis n means the largest. Then one way to define it is to have one over n quantile quantile, two over n quantile, n over n. But this n over n will again run into the 100 percentile whose theoretical quantile is positive 30, right? So therefore we could do it n plus one in the denominator. So therefore nothing would be zero or 100 percent. Then you'll find the corresponding theoretical quantile and then you compare the two. So this QQ plot is off, is not in the diagonal line because you have that. So what does it mean? It means that given the theoretical quantile, the empirical quantile is bigger in the theoretical quantile on the left tail. On the right tail, even the theoretical quantile, empirical quantile is smaller. So what does that mean? Being bigger or smaller? So it means that Given the same probability, you need to go to more on the right to get the empirical quantile to get the same probability compared to the theoretical thing. So, so what does that mean? It can tell you some information about whether the empirical residual distribution is more heavy-tailed or light-tailed than the theoretical distribution. If it's heavy-tailed, okay, heavy tail means that I'm not moving so to so to the right, so I can have this probability. So then the empirical quantile should be smaller than the theoretical quantile. So it should be this way. But if the empirical quantile is bigger than the theoretical quantile, then in the empirical quantile is more, I would say, light tail. So you move more towards the center to get the same probability. Left tail probability. So I'm just saying that you can use the relationship between empirical quantile, theoretical quantile to get an idea about the shape of a QQ plot, what does it imply? So a very good check yourself is to plot QQ plot if you just do samples, say X1 to, or maybe I'll just use a symmetry, X1 to Sn. If you sample them ID from T distribution with two degrees of freedom, which is known to be very heavy tail. And then you plot a QQ plot um, QQ plot against the standard normal distribution. So if you treat this as your theoretical distributor, you can make sure, okay, we know this is heavy tail, check the quantile quantile tail and see what it is. So I think okay. okay. So I guess we can stop here today because we're basically finished the diagnostics. Then next time we will talk about what if the mean is problematic? What if this, we see some residuals trend along the yi? So basically the mean function doesn't seem not, doesn't seem reasonable. One way is to transform our y. So we are not working with the y as measure. We can do some nonlinear monotone transformation of y, then the linear model might fit. So box box transformation for that purpose. So we'll talk about that next time. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
I'll see you at the regular time and location on Wednesday.